Hi, I'm Joy Lawrence. Welcome to my Emily Dickinson biography and poetry analysis. The sources I used for building this presentation, Emily Dickinson Museum, Modern American Poetry, and Encyclopedia Britannica. This is one of the few pictures we have of Emily Dickinson, and so I do present it for you on the title page. She was born in 1830 and she died in 1886. So for your poetry analysis for this section, uh, you're going to be doing feminist criticism. So I am going to give you a little bit, bit of background into Emily Dickinson's life, and I hope that it will be helpful for you in doing your feminist criticism of one of her poems. I wanted to go over one of her poems because, again, whenever you're going to have to do poetry analysis for one of your literature, literature analysis assignments, I want to make sure that I go over one of the poems from that poet with you first. Emily Dickinson did not title any of her poems, so and that was purposeful. She did not want them to have titles. So publishers have gone ahead and the titles of her poems, they have used the first line of each poem and that is then the title. So this poem is Because I Could Not Stop for Death and it was written in 1863. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tulle. We passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet, feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Again, we will come back to that at the end of my presentation. Just let it marinate there in your brains for a little bit while we talk about Emily Dickinson. This is Emily Dickinson's father, Edward Dickinson. He had a strict work ethic. Yet he could also be very impulsive. He was a lawyer and he did work long hours, um, but he was known for doing things like going out and ringing the church bells to draw the attention of the town to what he felt was a particularly beautiful sunset. Her mother, Emily Norcross Dickinson, whom she was obviously named after, she was your standard typical housewife of the time and she took a lot of pride in her baking and her gardening, her produce. And so she won awards for, for that at the county fairs. These are the Dickinson children. You have Emily Dickinson, her sister Lavinia, and her brother Austin. So like I said, we don't have a lot of pictures of Emily Dickinson, but we do have paintings like this that we can look at. And you can see, this is a painting that the parents had commissioned of their children. And you can see that they do look very similar. Emily Dickinson attended Amherst Academy from 1834 to 1847, and she had to drop out twice because of colds. So she was often feeling unwell, but she was also a delightful and gifted student. Her teachers considered her to be an original thinker, and she was, she was constantly impressing them. This is a picture of her brother, Austin, and this is an excerpt from a letter that he wrote to a friend about Emily Dickinson in school. He said, her, comp her compositions were unlike anything ever heard and always produced a sensation, both with the scholars and teachers. Her imagination sparkled and she gave it free reign. Now, the reason that I find this interesting is because later in her life, Emily Dickinson becomes a complete recluse and doesn't leave her house. And so I find it interesting because I want to see, was she always that way? But she was not. She attended Mount Holyoke Female Seminary for one year. And while she was there, they had a day where they were supposed to confess their faith and and profess their love for Jesus and give themselves over to God. Now, Emily Dickinson, we don't know exactly what her religious beliefs were. We do know that she was very well read, but we also know that she did not like to just follow along just to follow along. So she was the only student unwilling to confess her faith. Oh, by the way, this is, these are pictures of Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. And this is 
a silhouette that was drawn of her by a friend when she was 14. So because she was unwilling to confess her faith, she was ostracized. The other students didn't really want to have anything to do with her. The teachers there really didn't want to interact with her. And she was very sad about that. And in a letter she wrote to a friend, she wrote, I am not happy and I regret that last term when that golden opportunity was mine that I did not give up and become a Christian because she did not like the way that she was being treated. Now, Emily Dickinson grew up in a household of politically active men. Her father was a lawyer. Her brother ended up becoming a lawyer. And Emily Dickinson herself was very well read. In a letter that she wrote to her friend, Susan Gilbert, who is pictured here, she said, why can't I be a delegate to the Great Whig Convention? Don't I know all about Daniel Webster and the tariff and the law? So she was showing that she knows the issues of the time and what's happening. But because of her place as a woman in this time period, she was unable to use those skills that were natural to her. So again, you want to keep this in mind when you're doing your feminist criticism of one of her poems. How is the persona in the poem being held back? And you might even connect that to how Emily Dickinson is being held back. Emily Dickinson never married, but she did write a lot of love poems. And there's a lot of speculation as to who the focal point is of those love poems. And Charles Wadsworth is one of those contenders. They met when she went to Philadelphia. And they spent a, a, quite a bit of time together and they discovered that they were both solitary and romantic. And they, so that means that they were very much introverts, but they were also hopeless romantics. They had a lot in common. They enjoyed each other's company. He was married. And so that makes it difficult because if they did have a relationship, it would not be out in the open. In 1856, Austin married her best friend, Susan. And this made her very happy because she's now Susan lived on the property um, with the Dickinsons. Their father had this house, the Evergreen, built for Austin and Susan after they got married. Now there's also speculation that Susan is the focal point of Emily Dickinson's love poems and that Emily Dickinson was a lesbian. So that, in fact, there's a movie that just came out that you might find interesting. And, and it talks about that. It's a comedy and a drama. Uh, and it focuses on that idea that we, the way Emily Dickinson has been represented historically is not the true Emily Dickinson. So there is this speculation that Susan was her great love. Samuel Bowles is also someone that they think may have been the focal point of her love poems. He often went to the Evergreens because he was a friend of Susan's and Austin's. And he was a newspaper publisher. And Susan submitted one of Emily's poems, The Snake, to his newspaper. This was the only poem that Emily Dickinson ever had published. I like this quote here from Samuel Bowles because it says a lot about both him, Emily, and their relationship. This was when he came to visit her one time and she knew he was coming. But when he did arrive, she refused to come downstairs. He yelled up at her, Emily, you damn rascal, no more of this nonsense. I've traveled all the way from Springfield to see you. Come down at once. And she did. She came down. She was very hospitable. It acted like nothing had happened, that she had not been hiding upstairs. Again, like with Charles Wadsworth, Samuel Bowles was married. So if they did have a relationship, it would be kept secret. So again, we're not sure. Thomas Wentworth Higginson was another newspaper publisher. And in 1862, he did this call, which was a letter to a young contributor, where he asked amateur poets to send in their poetry to be published. And Emily Dickinson did want to be published, so she sent in some of her poems. He told her that she had a lot of creative originality, but that some of her rhyme scheme was off, the dashes and other punctuation came off as odd and that she needed to fix those things and then she would be able to publish her poems. Even though Emily Dickinson did want to be published, she still remained true to what she wanted to create. She decided to make no changes 
and, and she never did get anything published until after her death. He is also someone who they think might have had some kind of romantic relationship with Emily Dickinson, but again, we're not certain. They did have a, a relationship, some kind of relationship, and he was her confidant. She would often write letters to him complaining about things that were happening in her life, like this one. Um, he wrote this about being near her. He wrote, I never was with anyone who drained my nerve power so much. Without touching her, she drew from me. I'm glad not to live near her. She often thought me tired. Like I said, he was one of her confidants. And here is an excerpt from a letter that she wrote to him uh, complaining about her mother and her father. He buys me many books but begs me not to read them because he fears they joggle the mind. And then later, mother does not care for thought. And, and by the way, I just love this photograph right here of Higginson and his daughter on this bike. So these, these excerpts show how frustrating it must have been for Emily Dickinson. I mean, her father buys her books. I'm not, I'm sure it wasn't exactly, here's a book, please don't read it. But I'm assuming that her father was conflicted. He recognized that Emily had a bright mind and he wanted to nurture and encourage that. But he also recognized her place in the world as a woman would not be conducive for that. And her mother also was not encouraging. Emily Dickinson's eyesight started to deteriorate. So she went to Philadelphia to see a, a specialist. The first trip was in 1864, and the second trip was in 1865. While she was there, she stayed with her Norcross cousins. The eye doctor's advice was that the more she wrote and the more she read, the more her eyesight would deteriorate. So he said that she was forbidden to use a pencil or to write. She ignored this advice. Emily Dickinson later in her life started to seclude herself. This is a painting of the Dickinson household. This is a portrait that her brother Austin drew of her. So not long after that second visit, she wrote in a letter to a friend, I do not cross my father's ground to any house or town. So it was around this time that she started to seclude herself. These are pictures of Emily Dickinson's bedroom. Her house is now a museum. So you can go in and see where she did a lot of her writing. Most of it was done in her bedroom and also in the kitchen pantry. I know that we think of pantries as small, but it was large then. Emily Dickinson wore white almost all the time, if not all the time. And this is one of the dresses that Emily Dickinson wore. One more contender for her love poems, Judge Otis Phillips Lord. He's the only recipient of love, love letters that we have of hers. He was a friend of her father's and he was much older than she was. There were a series of deaths that Emily Dickinson experienced. And during this time, you'll see that her poetry gets a lot darker and becomes a little fixated on death. In 1874, her father died. In 1878, Samuel Bowles died. In 1882, her mother died. That same year, Charles Wadsworth died. And the next year, her nephew Gilbert died. This is the son of Austin and Susan. In 1886, Emily Dickinson wrote a letter to her Norcross cousins, and all it said on it was, called back and she died shortly after of kidney failure. After she died, her sister Lavinia went into her room and found almost 1,800 poems. Some of them were bound together. Some of them were written on the backs of lists of things, of maybe groceries to get. Um, Lavinia, by the way, also never married. So that's interesting. Lavinia and Higginson, Remember the newspaper editor, editor who told her that she had a lot of creative originality. The two of them collected all of the poems together. Higginson went through and fixed all of the rhyme schemes and the punctuation. And then in the 50s, 
there was an editor who said, you know, Emily Dickinson was brilliant and she had reasons for her punctuation and we have no right to change her artistic art that she has created. So in the 50s, he went back and fixed everything to go back to the way it was when Emily Dickinson wrote it. And so if you're reading something that was published after the 1950s, you're seeing the original format that Emily Dickinson used. All right, coming back to this poem. So starting with the first stanza, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. So you have this sets the tone of the poem. And so just right there in the beginning, you have a different kind of image of death than what we normally see. Death is normally scary and something to be feared, but here he's kind and calm. So you'll want to think about that too, because one of the other things that you have to do along with feminist criticism for this literary analysis is take a look at Emily Dickinson's language use. So you might want to look at some of her, her dashes or her rhyme schemes or her imagery. All right, so this next stanza, we slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. So because death is so civil, because he's so kind and there's no haste, there's no rush, she does him the, she gives him the respect of putting away her labor, the things that she feels she has to do and the things that she wants to do. This third stanza, we pass the school where children strove at recess in the ring, we pass the fields of gazing grain, we pass the setting sun. So here she's going through the stages of her life, kind of her life passing before her eyes, if you will. So she sees her childhood growing up, and then the setting sun is her old age. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. So now we are at the graveyard. And this is all imagery that an audience from 1960, I'm sorry, 1863 would recognize. The gossamer, her gown, that is the typical fabric that is used for those who are dead. Her tippet, which is a cape, it's made of tulle. It's a kind of a gauzy fabric like you would see in tutus. So this is the standard attire for the death. So somebody from an 1863 audience is going to get that imagery right away. But in our audience, we have to now look it up to see what some of these things mean. We passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. So you have here again, we're at that graveyard. You have the swelling of the ground because the grave has been dug. You have the cornice, that's that ornamental headstone. So again, an 1863 audience is going to get this imagery right away. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. So in this poem, in this death, for this persona, she gets to continue as long as she wants, because we already know there's no haste. And she says, since then, tis centuries. So she's doing this for a long time, for centuries. She's going back through her life. I hope I've given you something to help you with analyzing your own Emily Dickinson poem when it's time to do your literary analysis. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.